My name is Erin Schaefer. I'm the Economic Development Director with the Town of Reading, and I wanted to thank you all for joining us this evening. This is our the town's sixth annual Economic Development Summit, and uh, tonight's a little bit different from what we've done in the past. We're really here to hear from you, um, so we are going to keep our presentations and our comments short up front. And uh, I think many of you have already interacted with the tables behind you, but we're really hoping that engage with all of these tables tonight, um, and we are here to help facilitate discussion and hear, hear more information from you. So um, tonight, we want to know about your preferences and ideas around this idea for a future long-term vision of the new Crossing Road Redevelopment District, which is the area between the MBTA train tracks and Ash Street. And we also are joined here tonight by a Jason Sen uh, Senator Jason Lewis, as well as Reading's town manager, Del Maltes. Um, and we also have um, Chris Haley here tonight, who is a Reading Select Board member. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge all other colleagues here. I have a couple of colleagues here. We have RMLD, thank you for this space. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it over uh, to Senator Lewis for his remarks. Thank you, Aaron. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to be with you again this year. I was just saying to Aaron, um, I represent six communities, and actually Reading is the only one that does have an annual economic development forum like this, and I think that's terrific. And um, just appreciate Aaron, you, and Fidel, and the, the uh, select board, and, and everybody who's involved in making this, um, bringing us all together. Um, this is um, an especially important time to be discussing our local economic development plans because, of course, the impact of the pandemic over the last few years was um, you know, really devastating for a lot of our communities, our small businesses, our nonprofits, our schools. And um, so very important that we are thinking about uh, ways to uh, help support the, you know, the recovery. Um, I certainly, as I know, you do appreciate that Reading has long been committed to taking a thoughtful, intentional, and collaborative approach to local economic development. Uh, Reading first adopted Chapter 40R uh, under state law in, all the way back in 2009, and then uh, I know expanded the size of that district in 2017, uh, making Reading one of only 37 cities and towns in the entire state to embrace this program that encourages smart growth development and multifamily housing. Reading's legislative de de delegation, uh, basically speaking on behalf of myself, as well as um, uh, represent representatives Brad Jones and, and Rich uh, Haggerty, uh, share the town's strong commitment to promoting local economic development and creating new opportunities for small business growth, for housing, climate resilience, transportation improvements, and other infrastructure. We are proud that Reading's efforts over the years have been advanced by a very strong state-local partnership, including numerous state grants and other technical and financial assistance. And just to share uh, very briefly a few examples, um, obviously the uh, multi-million dollar project to upgrade and improve uh, Route 28, which uh, is um, I believe finally uh, complete, uh, maybe not quite complete, there's still a little more to go, but um, that's been a very important project, obviously, as a state, uh, you know, conducted by MassDOT. Um, also, we just recently celebrated a uh, $2.1 million Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant, um, and that's for flood reduction and wetlands restoration at the conservation area, and is, I believe, the second or third largest uh, grant of its kind uh, in the entire state. Um, and then um, just um, earlier this week, last week, I'm losing track of time, um, Governor Baker signed into law a bill that uh, Rep. Jones, Haggerty, and myself um, uh, sponsored to update the state's Green Communities Program so that communities like Reading that are part of regional MLPs will um, make it easier for them to join that program. And that's going to open up new grants for the town to, to, um, to receive for a variety of different energy efficiency, conservation, and clean energy projects. 
We do also recognize that local economic development and especially housing production, multifamily housing, is very challenging and there are valid competing interests. And a good example of this, of course, is the MBTA communities zoning, um, which um, we went through um, a lengthy process with DHCD and the initial um, draft regulations that they published, you know, were um, concerning in some of the um, some of the ways they treated communities like Reading. We um, had great feedback from the town and the delegation, and DHCD did certainly take into consideration a lot of that feedback. And the final regulations, um, I think, did address not all, but at least some uh, significant amount of those concerns. So we will continue to be working closely with with you all uh, on those issues, um, particularly again as it relates, relates to housing. At the uh, state level, we have um, passed multiple bills in recent years uh, to support economic development, transportation, housing, and climate resilience. Um, just a few examples here. At the end of last year, the state passed about approximately $4 billion, uh, what is known as an ARPA bill, the American Rescue Plan Act. And those funds from that bill will be flowing through um, existing state programs for climate resilience, housing, transportation, workforce development, and those funds will be, um, you know, we'll be seeing the benefit of those in, uh, in over the next few years. We also passed an $11.3 billion transportation and infrastructure bond bill in July, and that's basically intended to make sure that Massachusetts maximizes our share of the federal bipartisan infrastructure law that uh, Congress passed and President Biden signed. And that's very, very significant for our meeting our infrastructure needs over the next five to 10 years. There's a couple hundred million dollars in there for commuter rail electrification efforts. There's uh, 55 million for complete streets grants, which uh, Reading has taken advantage of and are a great way to improve um, downtown walkability uh, and safety for all transit users. There's also significant funding in there to promote the adoption of electric vehicles, including public charging infrastructure as well. And I know RNLB, RNLD has been on the leading edge of, of, of doing so. Um, we're also right now pushing to complete another major multi-billion dollar economic development bill um, that has passed both the House, the State House, and the State Senate, um, but needs final passage. And that would provide additional funding also for affordable housing efforts, for um, workforce development, for our uh, hospitals that have been struggling, again, because of the pandemic, uh, childcare funding in there, and also would include local earmarks. And if in the case of Reading, the delegation has secured $100,000 for the downtown rapid recovery plan here in Reading, and $25,000 each to expand the community garden at Matera. Uh, the Reading Food Pantry, and the, to support the efforts of the Reading, North Reading Chamber of Commerce. So we are pushing hard to get the final bill across the finish line and signed by Governor Baker, because again, it would include a lot of good things, including those specific um, earmarks for the town of Reading. There's also uh, what's known as a bond authorization in that bill, uh, which would be a million dollars to support the new uh, Senior Community Center, which is a priority for the town. Um, that doesn't guarantee the funding, but it authorizes it, and, uh, and then it would be up to the, the next administration to uh, release those funds. So, sorry to go on longer than I know you had wanted, but there's a lot going on, both locally and at the state level, and I appreciate all the work we're, we've been doing together. And speaking on behalf of myself and Rep Haggerty and Jones, again, how appreciative we are of your work and of the partnership, and we're very committed to continuing to work closely together to support um, local economic development. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lewis. Now I would like to turn the microphone over to uh, Select Board Secretary Chris Haley. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I briefly just want to mention uh, thank you to Aaron Meldy for, for hosting this uh, event over here, um, as well as the Family Day that they earlier um, that was here earlier, um, and while I was at the at the event, um, I took my drone up and was flying around and then panned over towards the Wakefield side, and all you saw in the distance was the lake that they had. 
Um, and it's not something that Reading has, because Reading would need a draw for, um, for downtown to be vibrant, et cetera, going forward. Now we can't create a lake here, unless, uh, unless we wanted to, but something as simple as just doing wings on a brick wall or little statues of ducks that Boston has that gets tens of thousands of visitors a year just based off of that. I even um, sold the Make Way for the Ducklings children's book when I worked at the Old North Church when I was younger, back uh, when I was a teenager. So it just, even something like that. So the Eastern Gateway over here is, I, I feel like one of the last chances Reading has to get a draw um, to Reading while alleviating some of the pressure on downtown as well because parking is coming in a premium over there. Uh, so to drive something else over in this direction um, and then everyone all, always has their thoughts on all the overdevelopment downtown, etc. This will you know, relieve some of that. Um, so before I, before I turn it over to Fidel, I also just want to acknowledge um, the Economic Development uh, Director, Erin Schaefer, for those of you that don't know, this is her last month in Reading. She was um, here, she started right before the pandemic and carried through it and, you know, to survive that. Um, and with all the businesses and everything that, that went up um, since then, um, it, it's really a good thing for Reading and um, she will definitely be missed. So if everyone could just give a round of applause to her. She's going to be smiling uh, in a couple of months, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so without further ado, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Fidel Montez, our town manager. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And, and yes, uh, just to echo what uh, select board member Haley said, uh, thank you, Evan, for, for, for setting this up. I know that, that it, it uh, uh, takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of uh, uh, coordination, uh, both uh, uh, technology, you know, the, the the pens, the snacks, uh, there's quite a lot of detail that, that goes into this. So thank you very much, Aaron. So welcome uh, to the Town of Reading's Economic Public Forum. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Tonight, our focus is to engage the neighborhood and learn more about your preferences for the future. Your continued participation in a long-term conversation will help, help the town make strategic public investments to be ready for future economic development opportunities to help the town continue to grow its tax base. Community engagement is something that we take very seriously and the feedback that the town receives tonight from the neighborhood will help us align any future plans for redevelopment with the existing fabric of the town. For more than a decade, the town of Reading has been planning for managed growth in its Eastern Gateway that includes the commercial and industrial land by Ash Street New Crossing Road, and Walker's Brook Drive. Further, recent changes to the downtown 40R Smart Road District land use policies at the April 2022 town meeting were designed to slow down development and limit density in the downtown, which to us indicates that it, it is a community goal to encourage economic development outside of the downtown. The Eastern Gateway has significant potential for transformational redevelopment opportunities this may include the redevelopment and adaptive reuse of the Reading Municipal Light Department Station 1, which is currently being discussed by the Reading Select Board and the RMLD commissioners. There, are also, there also may be future opportunities to attract increased commercial and industrial uses. While change will not happen overnight, we are using this opportunity to learn from you about your preferences to help inform strategic public investment and continue to be ready, ready for future managed growth and opportunities. Lastly, we respect the existing property owners in the yard, including RMLD, and have pursued a collaborative approach with all of them to assure that planning efforts involve stakeholders and that we can arrive at a positive income through shared vision. Thank you for your participation tonight and for your thoughts this evening. Aaron. Thank you, Peter. So um, now we'd like to hear from all of you. And I'm joined here tonight 
by David Gamble. He's the principal of urban design firm Gamble Associates. Um, in 2019, he created um, an urban design conceptual plan, which was presented at the Economic Development Forum in 2019. And again, tonight, we're looking at a lot of those details and hope to hear some really specific feedback from all of you on, on specific design themes. Um, we are also here tonight with Antonio Medina. Um, she is also an urban designer there in the back, and she'll be helping me um, and David uh, together. We'll be facilitating tables to have discussion, one on one discussions with you. So each table represents a specific topic. Up here, we have land use. Um, in the back, we have mobility, open space, and what we in the planning world called uh, called placemaking, which is actually just events in public spaces. We want to hear about what kinds of things you want to see. Um, so we have little post-its up there and failed to ask you to take a few, uh, but the goal is really to have everyone spread out at different tables and then kind of rotate. We have an hour allocated tonight to hear from all of you um, in that way, and uh, every 15 minutes we'll ask for people to rotate. Um, so everyone has an opportunity to speak to all of us um, and have comments for each one of these topics. Um, David, would you like to sure. say something? Thank you. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Jean. Can you all hear me in the back? Yeah. Great. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> really, it's, uh, it's a big ask for people to come out, and there is a substantial amount of planning fatigue that tends to happen. So your time is precious. We recognize that. If you did come for a lecture, I'm going to disappoint you because, as Aaron said, we do want this to be interactive. And economic development is complex. It involves lots of different things. We re realize that. But by dividing it up into these four topics, land use, open space, place making, and mobility, it does begin to hit the intersections between those things. So mobility, how do people get around? Not just by car, but by foot, by bike, by train. Land use, uh, also as Aaron said, it's pretty uncommon, or as Fidel said, it's uncommon to have a meeting in the geography in which we're working. So it's actually great to be able to look out the window and think about the businesses that are here, how this area may change over time, how to guard against that if there's fears about density, uh, but also how to leverage its proximity to the downtown and to transit. So we want to stimulate a conversation about the trade-offs involved in redevelopment, but also recognizing the benefits that can accrue from that, including more open space, which is uh, that topic there. Uh, Placemaking, it does sound like jargon, but what, what are some short-term, interim things that can happen very soon that might help people to change the, the sense of this area, which is, let's face it, about 90% impervious surfaces today. So it will be a conversation. We're right on time, but I want to maybe wrap up around 8.15, and then we're going to show a few slides. It was about three years ago that we were here. Seems like a lifetime ago. <laughs> uh, beginning to show some of these concepts, we, we will bring those back up again, but really we want to better understand what the community is thinking tonight. So how many of you, I'm just curious, may have been at the library three years ago when we were here last? Raise your hand high. Okay, so we, we didn't assume that you had, but it looks like about a dozen people. So we'll bring back some of those images as a way to sort of talk about what was spoken about then. Okay, so I, I see a question there. Yes? Can you just give us a brief look at this area in terms of, I'd like to know before I go into this, these tables, how many acres are we talking about here? What percentage is wetland? Do we have anything that shows them? No, Yes, great. Good, good, good. So the question was, what geography we're actually talking about? It'll be a little bit hard to see from a distance, and we'll turn the lights off to make it a little bit easier to see. Uh, 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 this is very hard to see, but at the biggest scale, there's probably 150 acres that were thought about that could be transformative in the Reading 2020 vision. Now, that would go all the way over to the highway and up across the... Uh, the geography there. Tonight we really want to focus on the smaller area here between uh, the commuter rail line and Main Street and Ash Street here. So it's really between Ash, the commuter rail, 
and the town yard. So that's probably about 10 acres. I mean, acres, it's a hard number to try to understand, but we really want to focus what's the transformative potential for this area around, including this building and the geography close to it. A good percentage of it is wetlands, but boy, you wouldn't know it because you can't really see it unless it rains, which by the way, there was quite a big puddle here tonight when I pulled in. So does that, is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through these slides again. But the, the reason why that's a great question is because it's easy to become a little too fixated on a building or a site. At the same time, it's overwhelming if you think about 150 acres. It seems like, well, that would take a generation to fill up. So tonight, as you go around to these tables, just be thinking about longer term, and by that 10, 12, 15 years in the future, how could you imagine these places changing? It's not gonna happen right away, as Fidel said. It's gonna take time, but what things could begin to happen sooner that would begin to help people think about this area differently? Off the back. Another question? <clears throat> well, I thought you had a question for us, what, what, what to think. Um, first and foremost, what I'm thinking is the, the traffic in that area, before we can even discuss this development, already as it stands, where the you know Jiffy Lubes is, the train station, McDonald's, yeah. it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. People right? crashing each yeah. other all the time. So That's what before we can even, I even think we can have this discussion, that needs to be. And your name, sir? To Joe Federer. Joe, okay, I'm going to send you immediately to the uh, mobility station. So yeah. <laughs> I think we're all going there. Yeah, I think we're all going. <laughs> no, we need someone at Land Use, please. <laughs> Yeah, it's a disaster about, as it is now. This what scares are we talking me. About that intersection or Walker Bush Drive. Yeah. Neither one of those can handle additional traffic. Yeah, yeah. and you can tell. Right. Any other conversation, there's got to be a conversation about yeah. improvements in those areas. Right, so it, it's again, right at that intersection there. That's where this map is, you know, it's dangerous to draw boundaries because, of course, that intersection is in really essential to how you get around town. Maybe one more question that I definitely want to sort of break out. It, the town yard, I believe, three years ago, wasn't really part of this conversation, was it? Or am I mistaken? It was. It was? Okay. Yeah. They want to hear the question? Okay. So, so it's not much changed since three years ago, or it's the same discussion? The town yard. Yeah, so I can answer that question real quick. Um, what you're seeing tonight on these slides is exactly what was presented in 2019. Okay. We want to take a, a deeper dive and deeper look into what your preferences are, and you'll see that come across in each one of these tables and the questions that we'll be talking about with you. Yep, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, one more uh, general, yes. Just, just, just a general, and I don't know if people are aware here, but there is a separate conversation going on about that traffic. There was a different traffic set, I don't know. If Gene, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. None of these things are happening in isolation, that's for yeah. sure. Right? Hi everybody, I'm Jean Delios, the Assistant Town Manager. Um, so the question is about the work that we've been doing over a period of years, looking at Walker's Brook Drive with our traffic engineer from Green International. And so we do have a variety of ideas, alternatives. We've been working through Senator Lewis's office on some grant funding to get us closer to what we need to do to solve some of those issues. We know we have a lot of work to do. So it's in the queue and it's definitely on our radar. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Sure. One more. Yep. I, also, I also heard that the McDonald's and the um, mobile station next to it, or the mobile station next to it, are going to be torn down and be made apartment buildings. So again, that adds more congestion. That's not true. That's not true. No. Okay. Thank you. But 128 tires, right? Yeah. 128 Tire um, has been through the Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission actually denied their request. So that is tied up with, I'll just say, lawyers, courts, and all those things. Well, that's one purpose for tonight, too, is also either to dispel myths or to try to provide some consensus. So if it looks like everyone's going to mobility, we can certainly slide around the tables. But for now, uh, try to go visit each one. Each table has a different way of interacting. If you like a, 
Hey, a placemaking, we want you to put a green dot if you like it, if a red dot, because uh, you don't really feel comfortable with that, and yellow is you're not sure, okay? There are stickies that we'd like you to put here with questions. Uh, open space is also a place to write. So if this is interactive. We hope you uh, participate uh, because when the conversation goes away, then all of those good ideas do as well. And we want to record this and then we'll come back with uh, a little report that asks, did we get it right? Did we capture this conversation? Uh, I know that there's a number of property owners here tonight in this geography. Could you raise your hand just so I can keep an eye out on you. Oh, oh almost all of you, <laughs> excellent, uh, super. So let's break up, I think at 8.15, we'll reconvene, we'll show some slides, and then we're gonna have a facilitated group conversation, okay? Thanks. No problem, okay, great. Thank you, if you wanna grab a seat again, or you can stand in the back, that's fine. In this portion of tonight, we're gonna if I could have your attention for a second. So we're gonna do a quick report back. Jean, uh, uh, Antonia, Aaron, uh, and myself, we're just going to try to recap what we heard at our table uh, with a few comments, and then we're going to bring up some images to help stimulate the conversation, and then we'll have a group, group discussion. So why don't we, you all can stay where you are, maybe that's fine, and Aaron, if you wanna S summarize what was clearly the hot topic of mobility. So we have a couple of hot topic issues here. Uh, one is I heard about the worst intersection in the world, which we totally agree with. And um, we have also heard that we need a public meeting or series of public meetings specifically about this intersection and some options. While the town has done some preliminary engineering work and preliminary design work, we really need to focus on this intersection and we have some really good ideas on how to connect. Um, the other thing that came through here was that most neighbors on Ash Street walk to and from different destinations in and around the town, to downtown, to the MBTA station, um, in and around the neighborhood, and there's a really strong preference to connect but the connection is not necessarily by car, but through walking facilities, both in the yard, or the space that we're calling the yard for recreational opportunities, but also um, functionally to, to walk or bike, um, not necessarily bike lanes on Ash Street, right? Um, to have a separate area to be able to walk and have a multifunctional path to be able to get in and around the neighborhood and in and around downtown from the neighborhood. Did I capture that okay? Are there other th details I need to know? Okay, we'll leave it at that. Um, and we learned a lot of detail here that's reflected on our plans and our notes. Those are the highlights. I'm just gonna record this, so give me one second, okay? I'm waiting for David to record it. I'm not you tell me, David. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I was here with the dots in the placemaking table. Um, we had some interesting conversations. Um, the most popular things by far were the farmer's market, which was unanimously the most beloved option, and the beer garden, which was also a bit polarizing. Um, another polarizing option was the winter lights. Um, some people had very strong feelings about it and some people liked the idea on a smaller scale. Um, some quick wins that were discussed were turning it, the area into playgrounds or a park or planting some trees, um, some walking paths. Uh, someone suggested a haunted house in, in one of the old built buildings, which was super interesting. And a new thing, I hadn't heard that before. Um, some people talked about summer concerts, some performances, some bringing some of the events into the buildings, not just outside. These are short-term goals, so that was interesting as well. Um, I think that's it. Is that okay? Thank you, Antonio. Jean. Hi. 
everybody. Um, I got to be on Open Space, and I got a lot of people saying, more Open Space, Jean, no more apartments. Did I capture that right? Yes. OK. So open space. People want green space. They want to go with their families and have uh, outdoor movies that we're going to show outside of the uh, historic power building. They want this to be part of a residential neighborhood incorporated in a way that the people that live here can enjoy this area and open it up. We have a beautiful view of the moon tonight. Um, there's a lot of potential. Walking paths as well. People love the idea of how can we connect to the downtown? How can we connect to one general way? Um, some people said, let's put a bridge over the railroad tracks. I love that. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting opportunities to do better with this area in terms of managing stormwater. We talked a lot about, well, where's the wetlands? Well, it's a sea of pavement right now. Um, and that just doesn't work. You can just look out this window and see a big giant puddle. This was all pre-regulations that required stormwater management. So we have the water flow sheet flowing, and that's what we have here. So we thought about ways to channel that water in rain gardens and um, swales and really make it beautiful and, and embrace that resource. So I thought that was really exciting. And um, I guess the last thing is the recreational areas, and people really like the idea of, you know, kind of passive recreation, and again, making it complementary to the residential uses in this neighborhood. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Uh, on the land use, I think first, first of all, there's a recognition that there are existing businesses here that are functioning perfectly well and actually are almost at capacity as I understand it. So part of the tension is actually both recognizing the uses that are here today and thinking in the future ways in which those uses might coincide with other uses or even other open spaces. But even that you must recognize that, well, if there's servicing requirements for existing buildings, that doesn't always uh, relate exactly to having a lot of green space either. So there's, there's inherent tensions in that. Uh, people were talking within the land use about greater co connectivity, also thinking about open space uh, in terms of other examples, uh, ice skating, Ipswich River Park, uh, large mixed use area, there was a conversation about housing and ways in which that might alleviate some of the burden from other areas. So that, does, that seems to be a conversation that's uh, here is if you want to preserve the downtown to have less housing there, then where else does that go and are there other places where that might happen? Uh, coexist with existing businesses, uh, need businesses in town have to work together. I mean, I have to say as an urban designer, this is really downtown. It's not that far of a walk to get to your town hall. But the perception actually seems much farther because of the infrastructure. So part of the problem is thinking about ways to make relationships between places easier, more accessible for people of all mobilities. And that then makes the distance seem less than it is. So part of it is perception and part of it is the current status of the infrastructure which doesn't really lend itself very well to movement so people have to drive so what we want to do now is just show a few more images and this is re this is actually things that we had shown three years ago and again knowing that many of you weren't here we want to walk through that a little bit uh, I don't know what happened there Towns and cities really need to capitalize on what makes them unique. They compete with one another. And increasingly, you're finding places like this as an interesting place that complements other areas in a downtown. That is to say, places that are becoming something else in transition are often some of the most interesting places in, in towns and cities. 
we broke up the themes into these four topics, and we're going to show you some slides to help imagine the future evolution of, of this area. I know that there's anxieties about density, but in fact, density needs to occur where public transit is most available. And we're not very far away from your, your, your station, but again, it's not a distance that you can easily get from one place to another. But increasingly, towns and cities to revitalize, to become more economically viable, to become better connected, need to build where there is public transit in place. I'm not sure how many of you have been to Asheville, but that town is just now nationally renowned as a cool and funky and arts-inspired, once industrial environment. And you can do a lot just with paint and color and programming in particular. I think Antonia had a lot of green dots around events and programs. That doesn't really require new buildings per se. You can work with what's there. In my hometown of Watertown, uh, the entire arsenal now is a mix of different uses. There's a, a black box theater in an old industrial building. There's a Panera Bread. There's uh, uh, now a lab actually going. And they're very well, they program those spaces very well. Big industrial buildings actually lend themselves to lots of, flexibil lots of flexibility. And when you go to San Francisco, when you go to Austin, when you go to some of these districts, you're seeing more development pressure in these types of places because, in fact, they can accommodate lots of different things to happen. Uh, in existing buildings, uses change, but buildings tend to remain. Uh, a climbing gym, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking, <laughs> Steve, that, that must be 30 feet to the top of that. You can do recreation in some of these, some of these facilities. And, of course, open space, that definitely seems to be a uh, a summary comment here is how do you remove some pavement, make what's called performative landscape architecture. It actually provides a service. It filters runoff. It actually makes it healthier. It allows areas to be to taken off of the combined sewer. Uh, so you're working with the landscape to try to create open spaces. And this is certainly a catalyst across the country is leveraging trails for redevelopment. Uh, here's an, uh, an image in Detroit. Uh, this is, imagine if there was a way to get from here to your main street that was well lit, landscaped, shaded, uh, branded even. This is a project we worked on in Buffalo, New York that created a, a connection between two places that didn't have a connection before. If that infrastructure is there, then suddenly you start to think about moving through them in a different way. Uh, Railroad Park in, in Philadelphia. And interestingly enough, as we said, the wetlands are right there, but you can't really see them. In business parks, increasingly, they're leveraging that landscape, creating a more impressionable landscape, and that adds value to attract businesses. It would, a, a whole lot wouldn't have to be done to make the wetlands into more of an amenity and to actually have it filter more water, collect more water, and that could become not a lake like your neighbors, but it could become a, an asset. And increasingly, again, with events that are happening downtown, are there things that can happen here on a periodic basis, on a temporal basis, on a seasonal basis? And finding those partnerships would really help to change the character of the place. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> those things are not always easily achieved. Uh, with mobility, I'm, I'm thrilled that there's actually this many property owners here tonight because you, in some ways, are in the driver's seat about what you think can happen here. Uh, Steve and, and uh, Johnny and your colleague there, you've got well, a great deal of real estate here. Uh, 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 the gentlemen from Cutlery also have a, a, a role to play here, and I think they came tonight because they also want to hear what the conversation is. So. Uh, Yes, we actually suggested previously there's a disconnect between the parking lot at the end of New Crossing Road and this space. And there's an elevation change, but if you could actually get through here, that would provide greater connectivity. Uh, density is not a four-letter word. Actually, you need some greater density to alleviate pressures elsewhere. And so there are, 
and we understand there are conversations and there's regulations surrounding height, a four-story building, in my opinion, is actually not too large. Because if you want to get people to be next to transit, you actually have to get some greater density, and that alleviates the pressure elsewhere. So some recognition, and you can do density well, that building heights can taper, setbacks are part of that, stepbacks, there are ways to design buildings to make them fit into the neighborhood. Uh, uh, we know that there's consternation about something like this, for example. And the wetlands, again, thinking of them more as not just drainage ditches, but actually as amenities. There are ways to do that that are productive and economically viable. And then uh, this is just a perspective literally right outside our, our door here, looking at the station number one, I guess as, it, as it's called. It's been vacant, as I understand it, for a generation or more. That's a great asset, boy. And one should think about ways to keep the building, to reuse it, uh, find partnerships in town. Uh, so just imagine for a second if that perspective uh, uh, had access, not a drag strip, but a right of way that would be well landscaped, that would have pedestrian crossings. There were conversations about connectivity here, uh, maybe some modest and, and, uh, interventions in the building facades that would highlight what's happening on the inside uh, and ultimately creating a place. This is a place now, but a place that would draw more activity and, and create an interesting destination. So this is our suggestion and I'll show you a plan about how that impacts the geography. Uh, this building, this picture is already out of date because the town has gone in and redone this parking lot, but boy, that's just a great structure. It should be something else. It should be leveraged, it should be celebrated. It could be an art center. It could be uh, provide some of that shade and placemaking that people have been talking about. Uh, and it needs to be more vibrant. It's along Ash Street. It could be a real cultural anchor. Uh, and we understand those conversations have started. It could be remarkable. And it could complement other things that you have in town. And if we were looking on Ash Street here, and there's the building, and here's where we are right now, uh, thinking about improvements to that street, here's that public space. Uh, this is not going to happen. This is <laughs> our ambition. I see people shaking their heads. Uh, but that's where density actually could occur uh, along Ash Street and providing greater connectivity. Lastly, just as a summary, these were just some cartoons, and again, we, we don't believe that the solution here is to so wholesale redevelop the site. We actually think that some of these buildings have that unique character that attracts people. And if you imagine just some ways with some outdoor terraces, maybe some interesting signage, better access, so that those uses uh, could be uh, made more evident in the public realm, we think that would be great. Uh, uh, this building, for example, finding ways to reclad them or open them up into some public space, landscape buffers. Uh, here, this is a, obviously a different building, but imagine some places for bike storage and some more trees and pedestrian scale lighting in particular, so it doesn't seem like a place that you don't might not feel safe out at night. Uh, or here again with the cutlery building that we <laughs> suggested some interesting signage and. When we got a tour, it was fascinating. And again, people like to see things getting uh, uh, made or, or, or rehabilitated. And so we were really kind of, I guess, encouraging uh, them to try to open that up a little bit, not as a tourist destination, but at least as a way to celebrate uh, the industry. So I'm gonna just conclude by showing this drawing and I, I'll leave it up and we can, you can zoom in, but let me just explain it, what, what we're showing here. So. What we're proposing is that New Crossing Road actually connect through Pond Meadow Drive to station number one. So that is a new right of way that would connect uh, these buildings over to New Crossing Road across the tracks, perhaps with a roundabout here. That's the frame, uh, um, uh, the frame building now. This could potentially be more of the higher scale um, office uses that are there, obviously keeping this commercial. 
and then making the wetlands into more of an attraction here uh, and, and a more performative landscape. Now, I'm going to show you uh, uh, that in this version, it also connects to Ash Street. So if you are an urban designer, connectivity, a lot of what we talked about mobility, connections are good. If you're in a butter, well, you see, well, that's now a cut through. Right? So this is an inherent tension uh, about planning where on the one hand, you actually do want to facilitate connections. On the other hand, if this is not engineered in the right way, then that would draw traffic off of, this, off of the main drag down through here. So there is another solution which might just terminate this little right of way to the historic building and have parking around there, perhaps with some new development there. So uh, I'm going to end on a controversial note, I guess, uh, because this is clearly stepping too far. We're, we're making assumptions about the property owners that may not be thinking about the same thing. But from an urban design standpoint, these are important decisions that the town should continue to talk about and we feel that there is benefit knowing that you're diminishing what is really 90% asphalt and making it more maybe 60-40 open space and access. Okay, with that, I'm sure I've upset nearly everybody in some way or another. <laughs> so, Gene, I'll uh, hand the mic to you and I'm gonna leave. No. <laughs> Pay no attention to that man. No, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you, everybody. This has been a really great opportunity to have this conversation. And the word that I'm using tonight is the vision word. And we here in Reading, we create this vision by hearing from you, the people who live here, the people who have your homes here. And so this is so critical to our work, Aaron, myself, Fidel, and the whole team um, making sure we get this right. So thank you for coming out. Um, I want to thank everybody on the panel tonight and all of our speakers, um, everyone that did their part with our stations. I think it was a lot of fun. Um, I also want to say a shout out to Aaron. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your commitment. As you go on to your next phase, uh, we're going to miss you. And I just want to say thanks for making economic development what it is here in Reading. Um, I also wanted to um, emphasize that the work here tonight is not done. We are just scratching the surface. So I'm really hoping if you haven't had a chance to sign the sign-in sheet, please do so, so that we can have you in our uh, quick to print email database and let you know when there's more meetings like this to help us get it right. Um, there are a couple of meetings that I wanted to highlight coming up if um, anyone's interested. We have a, a new resident open house, and that is Tuesday, October 18th, uh, 5.30 to 7.30 at the Reading Public Library. So if anyone's interested, that's a really nice event. Um, we are also having a um, public forum on Monday, October 24th, and that's the um, housing production plan. Uh, and we're interested in hearing, you know, we have this um, requirement that the state imposes on the towns to create affordable housing, we should be anyway, um, and planning for it is really how we like to do it. Um, so we'd love to hear your feedback on how we can do better with affordable housing, how we can plan for it, and how we can do it in a way that's right for Reading, but still gets us to the numbers that we're supposed to achieve. Um, so I think that's really it. I, I really welcome everyone mulling around. There's refreshments in the back, so please um, feel free to enjoy your uh, refreshments. David Gamble, Antonio. Um, if we want to continue to, to hear from everyone, I would welcome that. We still have a little bit more time, um, and so we can continue that right now. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Yes. Uh, David, I want to clarify something with you. Um, uh, do I have to Can you hear? Yeah. Can you hear? I just want to clarify something on the density. I think most people here understand that density is not necessarily a bad word, and we, are, uh, we know that it needs to take place and welcome it downtown. Um, it's the extent of the density, right? And it's the fact that so many of the developers want to use up every inch of available space and not give back any like open sense of breathability of, of open openness at all or any 
place for real, true shade trees that are going to, the downtown is a hot spot. Down there by the train station is horrible. Ash Street is horrible. There's no big trees. It is just hot. No one wants to walk here. It's not safe, but it's not, it's, it's going to just be like a big, you know, heat zone. So we're not opposed to density. It's how it's done. And that's a big piece, both the, the, the design, the degree, and, um, and just there's been some pushback about the develop, from my point of view anyway, about developers needing to take all, practically all the space on the site. It just, it makes everyone unhappy. We can accept that if it's done attractively and with those features incorporated. So. Great point. Uh, it's impacted by parking ratios as well. Uh, and developers will always try to maximize the real estate, that's for sure. Other comments? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for sure. tonight. Um, without getting too far into the weeds, um, it wasn't clear to me from your map um, where the connection to Ash Street would be. Um, where would um, where would it connect out to Ash? Sure. So right here, this road right down here. Right? Yes, the, I'm sorry, the question is where, where would it show? And the fact is, it hasn't been determined. I, I think that would need to be studied in a great more detail. Where we're showing it on this diagram is along, so we're in this building right here, it looks different because this is a, this would be shown as a multifamily building, but the, here, this is the station number one and we're showing it skirting along the side, basically where the access drive is now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but again, knowing that that's unlikely to happen, <laughs> so it doesn't have to happen. You could even still end it here, but this would make a nice little open space that everyone's talking about in front of that building. That would be transformative. I mean, that would be an amazing project. How many apartments slash condos plan on putting in here? So we're, we're not pl planning it. Uh, the development community would sort of look at that. I think they'd have to make offers on existing properties and the densities would be determined of available land and I think it would also depend upon what the town's regulations are. Uh, developers are by and large going to try to maximize the development. There's no doubt about it. One benefit, and this is going to come across as a little esoteric, is Ash Street actually does have a rise to it such that the buildings that are on this side are lower because there's an elevation change. It varies from 5 feet to as much as 20 but that does change the relationship between one side and another. So density can be done well. Uh, you can also have development. To answer your question, I don't mean to be skirting it, but a building like this that we're showing would probably be 40 units. What is this zone that I forget? What is this zone? This is zoned industrial. What, what, what level industrial? You know. Mm -hmm. You're going to have congestion and chaos. And again, I'm just speaking about because of where I live and what I see right now yeah. with where it, how this is. I, my street is ridiculous. Which street is that? It's cross. It's, okay. it's from Main to Ash. It comes right off of 128. It's a straight shot. It's a straight mm -hmm. shot. And nobody's going to want to stay on 128, 128 to get down to Walkersburg to come the back way. They're going to they're gonna come off onto Main Street and Reddit. And they're going to come down across, they're going to come down Avon, and they flood. It's, and you're throwing 40 units in there? I mean, that's just one, sure. that's just one building. That's, that's, and, the, and I know you say the train's there. People don't take the train. If you live here, you'll see. People drive. I mean, it's ridiculous, the, the traffic that I've seen in the past thing since I moved here. I don't mean to diminish that comment. I do think that things will trend differently in the future. Okay. And especially if you get people living in a downtown that don't need to drive everywhere because now the sidewalks are better and the landscape is more robust and there's better lighting, then that equation changes a little bit. When it's hard to get from point A to point B, people are gonna drive and that's part of the problem. Jean, did you I wanna? Just, I just wanna say a quick thing. You know, any kind of zoning change that would be contemplated here would be again part of this conversation, and um, this this zoning now that we have is is 
it allows a variety of uses under the industrial zoning. Um, there's also an overlay district, and I won't go into all the zoning mumbo jumbo, but um, I think that would be um, a conversation that we'd have to really have, and the planning commission would have to really study it and come up with, you know, invite the neighborhood in and say, we're looking at zoning, what do you think? Um, and go through that iterative process to, again, get it right. A uh, question in the back? So you mentioned zoning, you mentioned the, the town's involvement. What is the town doing and the town leadership doing to make sure we don't have builders out there building right up to the sidewalk with no setbacks or four-story buildings downtown? What is the town doing to look at zoning and make adjustments to zoning so that this isn't happening? Where we're kind of... Yeah, that's, um, that's a good high. question. We, we heard a lot of, uh, that people thought it was too much. And so town meeting voted last spring at April town meeting to uh, really restrict that kind of development and put a lot more requirements on it. And uh, we don't have any projects in the pipeline right now, you know, that hadn't already come forward before. Yeah, me too. But, yeah, you too, still. But if, until we get ahead of the numbers on the 40B stuff, we can get, still get screwed. Absolutely. I always say with affordable housing, um, you know, the state requires that we have 10% affordables. And it's a moving target, what that really boils down to. Um, I've been doing this a long time, 40 years. And I can tell you, every time I thought I had it and we were there with affordable housing, the state would write a letter and say, oh, no, no, no. So these units come off the list and you're not there anymore. So it's this crazy system of trying to be proactive so that you're achieving what the state's requiring and you're providing affordable housing, which is, I think everyone agrees it's important, um, but you're doing it in a way that works for the town and is respectful of the fabric of this community, not like I think Senator Lewis said, this MBTA communities thing is crazy how they want the the number of units to be in the, in the cities and towns who have you know public transportation is so much. So uh, doing it the Reading way and the way that people can relate to it is the goal in my mind. Um, 40Bs, those are the ones that bypass zoning. So the corollary to what we've done in the downtown, if we hadn't done that, we would have seen more of what's going on at Eaton Lakeview because the developers can come in if you're not at 10% and put housing anywhere, anywhere, in your neighborhoods. And that's what doesn't work about 40B. We've spent many, many, yeah. many countless hours in uh, zoning board 40B public hearings, and it's a rough, rough process. Um, the Eaton Lakeview neighborhood did an awesome job with a lot of great ideas, and we got a much better project. But um, I would, in my opinion, I think it's better to grow the housing yourself than have a developer come in and say, I'm gonna plop down however many units. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, but that's why we like to plan. And hopefully we can, this housing production plan that we're working on can give us some good ideas for how to get there in a way that is ready, not anybody else. What number are we at? We are over 10% right now. Okay. But as I say, Change. it's a moving target. The census hasn't come out yet, right? Yeah, well, we have we have that, but um, we're we're actually closer to ten and a half, so we're we're good. But there's all these rules that I won't bore you with that we could units will come off the inventory, so we've got to keep. That's why the plan is important and a, a game plan for how we're going to stay ahead of this. Gene, we will provide these slides afterwards. How, yes. how can people um, access them? We'll put them on the town website. On the town yep. website, okay. Yep. Thank you. Don't forget to sign the sign in sheet if you have. Well, we won't keep you here. Uh, thank you for your patience, really. Thank you for coming out tonight. We will continue to stay around. We're happy to chat more, but uh, really, Reading is, I think, in the driver's position here about what they want to see happen. 
And I know sometimes there's feelings like these events are simply a way to record a few thoughts and what's going to happen is going to happen anyway. But I assure you that's not the intention here. Is anything that needs to happen outside of this window really will only be successful if it's a community-based vision uh, 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 that, uh, for the future. And so I assure you that these comments will be reflective of this conversation. We'll try to document it as best we can. Uh, but there are, there's a great deal of opportunity right outside here. And I think that as geographies become fewer and fewer, making informed, smart decisions about an evolution like of this area is going to be key to your downtown. And I would say that this is really part of downtown if it was easier to get from place to place. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you.